Hi, Misha here, and this time we go all the way back to the very beginning. 1915, the Great War, in what was just at first known as Tank. And so I have two 172 scale die cast here, one of a Mark IV and one of a Mark V. Very interesting looking creatures. <laughs> and very big and very heavy. These were classed as heavy tanks. There would be light tanks, or at least medium tanks, in the form of the Whippet later as well, but that's a story for another day. Today, we're going to talk about these. Like I said, this is a Mark IV, and this is the first one to really go into full mass production, and really the most mass-produced tank for a very long time in history. But it did begin with the original tank, originally named that because it was uh, erroneously said to be for conveying water to troops at the front, and the idea was to break the stalemate, pretty much the idea of all of World War I after the initial first half year. So it needed to be able to cross trenches, cross ground that had been hit by artillery over and over and over, and um, withstand machine gun fire, so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the early history and the politics of Little Willie and the Scorpion and all that. It's very fascinating, but this would be too long of a video, and I just don't feel like it. But I will say the initial prototype was ready at the end of 1915 and was shown off to several in the British government, as well as trialed on mock battlefields beginning in January and running through the spring of 1916. And the design was primarily built at uh, a few different factories, but Metropolitan mostly did the Mark I. And not many Mark I's were built, about 150. And they started doing what they called male and female, something that will continue on. We'll talk about that in a bit. But basically, male are more heavily armed, female are more lightly armed, in a way. But, very uh, different vehicle. The whole turret less design was because of the track system and, and just the, the overall ergonomics. They didn't feel it was worth it and that it would get in the way. And this was done so it could kind of rock around and cross trenches. Again, that was kind of its primary thing. Now the original Mark I, it was about 28 tons for the male and about 27 tons for the female. And it was about 25 and a half feet long. So not a small craft. It had a crew of eight. It actually took four to drive it, including the commander. And then the other four did duty as gunners. It was a gasoline-powered critter with about a 105-horsepower engine. Originally, the Mark I, the fuel tank was towards the front. You can imagine that wasn't ideal. It had a maximum speed of about 3.5 miles per hour. And with about a 50-gallon tank, it could go about 30, 35 miles. Mm -hmm. It, uh, and even then, you're probably closer to 25, truth be told. But, um, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> early days. Early days for everything at this point. Um, armor was about 6 millimeters up to 9. And that was enough to withstand original machine gun fire and, and what have you. If it got hit by artillery, it was done for. But since there were no other tanks on the battlefield with cannon, this was enough in the beginning. 
and it was not for carrying infantry and its primary armament were two six pounder long barrel guns on the male version and we had three Hotchkiss 303 machine guns for defense. Now on the female we get rid of the six pounders and we have Vickers guns instead. A little bit different although still in 303. And so this will have one Hotchkiss and four Vickers guns. The main problem with the Hotchkiss it had a very small feeding device of about 14 rounds at this time. I actually used to have a Hotchkiss strip like that. But, uh, you know, it needs must and all that. They're still learning the ropes. And what they did, they had these sponsons on the side here. You can see on this tank. And these were actually removable. And so a male and a female would have different sponsons put on. And the, the uh, females were actually a little different shape and everything for the machine guns. The uh, six-pounders required a crew of two, a loader and a gunner. As we know, of course, there was no radio. They used pigeons, pretty famously known, and the hellacious working environment and unreliable engine, also very famously known. Anyway, so that was the Mark I. It was accepted into military service in August of 1916 and first saw combat on September 15th during part of the battle for the Somme. And would uh, not really, I mean, it would see some combat, but it was very quickly replaced by the Mark IV here. Now, initially, the Mark IV was to have a new engine, a new transmission, in addition to several other improvements. However, while the order was placed around August of 1916 for the improved version and then canceled and then remade and then modified at the end of that year. They were supposed to be in service by April of 1917. By May, the engine and transmission and a few other components were still not ready, so the design was put into production, which is some of the improvements. They kept the same engine, transmission, they did relocate the fuel tank from the front to the back, and they increased it to about 70 gallons. It also had a slightly higher top speed of about 4 miles per hour. They also replaced the Hotchkiss and Vickers guns with Lewis guns. They were lighter, more compact, they had a better feeding device for use in a tank, but they were more prone to overheating, especially than the Vickers. But Again, needs, must. They also modified the six-pounder guns, going to what we would know as a QF six-pounder, which had a shorter barrel. This was done so that mud wouldn't clog it as much going across the trench if it dipped down. Also, because it was a shorter, handier gun, it was just easier to swing to point. You know, more of a modern-style piece of uh, kit there. And they would typically carry about... 330 shells for these, with about 180 being of the high explosive variant. Very good for anti infantry. Still had a crew of eight, still was pretty darn miserable conditions. It was still using essentially the original engine and transmission with only minor tweaks. So, yeah, pretty crappy inside. But there were a few product improvements besides, including increased armor. It went up to about 12 millimeters, and there was a very good reason for this. The Germans had developed 8 millimeter armor piercing rounds that could go through 6 or even a little more millimeters of armor, but 12 millimeters was pretty effective at deflecting even the AP rounds, making it pretty impervious. Plus, hey, now we're smoking at the speed of 4 miles per hour, right? And we have more range. But it was still suffering from a lot of breakdowns. As is famously known, the crew inside were wearing gas masks. They were wearing bits of uh, chain mail, believe it or not, as well as leather to protect them from 
everything flying around in there and the heat and everything. Just, yeah. And there's this kind of interesting device strapped across the top on this model. This is the unditching beam. Initially, they would carry this wooden logs or bundles in the front. But later, they would go to a slightly more formalized version here, which was essentially wood, often plated with steel. And this could be thrown down to get better traction because they quickly experienced that these were getting stuck. Uh, they did okay on dry ground, even if it was pop-marked. They could cross a trench of about eight feet, so that was good. But if it was muddy, rainy, snowy, yeah, they, they had some issues. Again, still only about a 105 horsepower engine trying to push, well, at this point, 30 to 31 tons. The uh, Mark IV is necessarily a little heavier because of the added armor and extra fuel tankage and so on and so forth. But yes, these went into production in May of 1917, and since they only had 100, give or take, Mark I's, they were desperately needed. In fact, the initial order was for 1,000. What about the Mark II and Mark III? Well, 50 of each were made. Both were training tanks. The Mark II was meant to be a trainer for the Mark I. The Mark III was meant to be a trainer for the Mark IV. <clears throat> Some Mark IIs were actually pressed into service in uh, the spring of 1917. Um, but the Mark III does not seem to have been. Either way, they weren't meant for full combat. Some said they were even made from unhardened steel or mild steel, as the Brits like to say. So the Mark IV was very welcome and would soon get its baptism of fire. This one is a male. Actually kind of neat because the guns do move. Here are a couple, a little 1-100 scale from Panzerkampf that I had picked up before finding the bigger ones. But there is one male, one female, just to show you. You can see how the sponsons are a little uh, different shape and the uh, machine guns have different traverse and mounting. There's also, of course, the one machine gun in the front on the, both of them. But uh, also, interestingly, there isn't one in the back, which, um, yeah, I know the side ones can, in theory, kind of get you there, uh, point rearwards, but mm, compared to the A7B from Germany, yeah. Anyway, their combat debut would come on June 7, 1917, at the Battle of Messine Ridge. 60 Mark IVs would be available, and they were slow in plotting, but, and even though they couldn't even always keep up with the infantry, they, they did okay. They, for an initial thing, they met their objectives and didn't get their asses handed to them. Unfortunately, as rain set in later in the year and battlefields became muddy, that wasn't uh, always the case. What would happen, they would often get stuck. And uh, once stuck, there wasn't much that the crews could do. Sure, they could use their machine guns to fight off and whatnot, but artillery could get a range on them and blast them. Or infantry could come up with grenades and uh, lob them and do that. So they kind of became sitting ducks. The uh, first mass tank engagement would come in November at Cambrai when about 460 were used. And again, while they weren't perfect, they did achieve their objectives, kind of showing that uh, mass tank formations could overcome trenches and trench defenses. And it was the beginning of the end for trench warfare, frankly, although, of course, at the time, that wasn't known. And then moving into 1918, there would be the first tank-on-tank -tank battle in April, a7V against two Mark IVs. And uh, the female Mark IV couldn't really do much. 
so it backed off. The male Mark IV would fight, but essentially both A7V and Mark IV would, would back off. It's also worth pointing out that it took Germany a long time to make their own tanks. So in the interim, they captured a few dozen British tanks, around 40 usually is quoted, and they started deploying them at the end of 1917. This actually caused the Brits to have to kind of mark their tanks more distinctly so friendly fire wouldn't happen. Another kind of fun story. Originally, you know, the, the tank was kind of built with a lot of input from the Navy. They had a lot of experience with their armor plating and guns and just, you know, the whole land ship concept. And they originally gave them disruptive camouflage, that very interesting camo you can see on some World War I British ships, the, you know, patches and colors. And they tried this on the, the tank initially, but they realized it was pretty pointless because the paint would get covered up by mud or worn away. So they just went to boring drab brown pretty quickly because uh, these things were big. Now, they weren't as tall as you might think, only about eight and a half feet tall. Uh, so not as tall as some later tanks. But, um, yeah, they, they would be built at around six factories in the UK, but uh, Metropolitan would build the, the bulk, the majority. The company that would later become uh, Vickers Armstrong would build some in World War I, but they weren't associated together yet. It was just Armstrong at this point. And deliveries would continue throughout 1918. And um, the last ones would be delivered pretty much at the end of that year. And the Mark IV would quickly be retired out of the British Army after World War I. They had other ideas. However, we still have the Mark V over here to talk about. All right, so originally the Mark IV was to have a new engine and transmission over the Mark I. And originally the Mark V was to be essentially a new design. Well, the Mark IV ended up just being a somewhat upgraded Mark I using the original engine and all that. And right when production's really going and everything, Finally, the new transmission and engine are ready for production. So to keep, kind of keep things going and to introduce a better tank, the Mark V is essentially made into what the Mark IV was initially going to be, and the clean sheet design was scrapped. They, they never made a prototype. They only got to the design and mock-up phase anyway. And these would appear in December of 1917 first entering military service in May of 1918. And they would first have combat on July 4th, 1918, at the Battle of Hamel, where 60 Mark Vs would make a decent showing for themselves, supporting Australian troops. And actually, a number of Mark V would be supplied to the U.S. Armored Corps and be their first really heavy tanks ever. In fact, one surviving tank is in America today because of this. So what makes it different? Well, it's mostly internal. It's a little bit longer at about 26 and a half feet. And we have the new engine. It's 150 horsepower now. We have a new steering system, which actually takes a lot of workload off the crew. We have a new transmission. We have a slightly larger fuel tank at a little over 90 gallons. We're also uh, smokingly fast at 5 miles per hour now. And we have increased armor protection, at least somewhat. In the front, it's up to 16 millimeters, although most of the rest is 12 with uh, 8 millimeters kind of top and bottom. Pretty much the same drive system. We have the same armament, except we've gone back to the Hotchkiss machine gun. It was always better suited than the Lewis gun, but what, what they were waiting on was a feeding device better suited for tanks. And now that they have a flexible belt feed system that can hold 50 rounds, that, that's good enough. 
still doing male and female, still mostly being produced by Metropolitan. Now this one is an interesting variant because it has a female sponson on one side and a male on the other. This means it has one QF six pounder and one Hotchkiss 303 machine gun. This was done after Germany started fielding tanks so that essentially every British tank could have at least one actual cannon because the female was pretty ineffective against anything with armor. And it's uh, usually officially called the composite, but really is known as the hermaphrodite or hermaphrodite because of having both male and female things. <laughs> so we have that. We also have an additional machine gun in the back, finally. Now for a total of four on the male, or five on the hermaphrodite, or up to six Hotchkiss machine guns on the female. It's actually probably a good thing. Still have a crew of eight. And um, pretty much the same. They, they've they improved a little bit. But of course, if you're going to talk about the Mark V, you have to mention its unfortunate habit of suffocating its crew. Yeah, it wasn't properly ventilated because of the change, especially with the rear machine gun position and what have you. The ventilation system, the air intake was changed. Uh, and yeah, it, yeah, they had, they had problems. They, they, they would uh, suffocate. Of course, later they would work find workarounds, often leaving the doors open or other things, but even that wasn't enough. Let's just be honest, Mark I, Mark IV, Mark V, working at any of these was hell. So maybe passing out was a benefit? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> they would build 400 Mark Vs, 200 male, 200 female, and they would be used in nine major engagements in 1918. The U.S. would really have their first tank battle with these in September of that year. And uh, while several were lost or disabled or got stuck, in the end, they did meet their objectives and penetrated the German lines, yet again enforcing the fact that trench warfare was on its way out. Germany only produced 20 A7Vs, but Britain produced about 2,000 heavy tanks in uh, World War I. Over 1,200 were Mark IVs, 400 were Mark Vs, and the balance tended to be Mark V stars. Kind of an interesting variant. It had an extension put in the middle, but it was about six feet longer and it had larger doors and what have you. And what was interesting, that extension allowed it to carry one squadron of troops. And this kind of made it an early APC in a way. And they would build about 580 of those. And several would be given to the Americans as well. There was also supposed to be a Mark V Star Star, which had improved tracks, because when they lengthened it, they really didn't adjust the, the track system, and so it really couldn't turn. I guess if you're going in a straight line, that doesn't matter, but yeah. But they only made 25 of the Mark V Star Stars, because they were just going into production when the war ended. And at the end of 1918, the Brits pretty much canceled all tank production with the final ones being delivered in March of 1919 just kind of fulfilling contracts of the Mark V. So this um, was kind of the ultimate in this first generation of heavy tanks here. It did have better defense, it did have better armor, it was faster 
It was pretty much better in every way except for the unfortunate tendency to smother its crews. Oh well. No one's perfect, right? So what about after the Great War? Well, in the UK, they reduced their armor down to just five battalions. And uh, pretty much all the Mark IVs were retired and scrapped. They would be equipped with either Mark Vs or the, uh, the Mark C, which was the later version based on the Mark A, the Whippet, so a medium tank. And um, throughout the 20s, the Brits became more interested in light tanks and medium tanks, which eventually would evolve into cruisers and infantry tanks, so on and so forth. And so while the Mark V would serve throughout the 1920s, by the end of the decade, it was pretty much out of service in the UK. Its day had uh, come and gone. But this one here is actually in a Russian livery because in 1919, around 70 Mark Vs were sent into Russia to get involved in their civil war and uh, side with the whites. And while they did see some engagements against the Bolsheviks, as we know, they would win the war, the Bolsheviks, of course, that is, and they would end up with uh, several dozens of the Mark V, and they would press them into the nascent Red Army because they didn't really have tanks of their own. They would later get interested in the FT, which would lead to the T-18 and all that stuff, but so for you know the early and mid-20s, the Mark V was kind of their primary tank. In fact, they used it to secure the Bolshevik stronghold over what would become the USSR, kind of conquering satellite states and what have you. And while most would be retired out of service, they would be kind of around. And um, four of them would be recorded as being used in the summer of 1941 to fight off the German invasions at uh, Tallinn. They were basically dug in and used as pillboxes or what have you, but they were used. Kind of interesting. Also interesting, when the Germans did invade the Soviet Union, they captured two that had been on display as part of a war memorial, and they carted these off to Berlin. And there are rumors that in 1945, the Germans actually rearmed and deployed these to fight off the Allies. However, the rumors are not confirmed, and it doesn't seem terribly likely, but it's possible. They were very desperate. More likely, they were just in Berlin and were damaged by all the bombing and artillery and everything else going on. But at the end of World War II, U.S. troops did uncover two Mark V's hiding out in Berlin, Nazi Germany. Yeah, kind of interesting. And uh, again, this is the hermaphrodite style. Has the female sponson on this side and the male on this side. Very interesting first efforts, and very different looking than what Germany came up with, and even what France came up with in uh, the First World War. But we'll get to those eventually. But I wanted to uh, address these and talk about them a bit, just because we've been covering British tanks, and this is where it all began. And it kind of ended, at least in some sense, with the tortoise we saw last time. That was kind of the last of the true heavies. After that, they went to the NBT or Universal Tank. So what made you think? I, this one was one I was looking forward to doing. Been planning for a while, so finally happy to do it. With that, if you could, please like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.